As today's most urgent question, uh, will the surge work? And uh, as you all know, only history will tell us whether the surge worked and to what way, in what way it did work. But in any case, what we're interested in is uh, the thinking of our guest, Dr. Kagan, uh, about the surge. And as all of you know, he, he um, is one of the architects, one of the advocates of a surge policy. Uh, the uh, report of the American Enterprise Institute on uh, Iraq planning presented a report uh, which was a path to victory uh, in its title. It paralleled, of course, the Hamilton and Baker uh, Iraq study group report. It's a report which um, is very positive. It apparently has gotten the ear of the President of the United States, which makes Mr. Kagan's thinking all the more interesting to us. Uh, Mr. Kagan is a graduate of Yale University uh, in Soviet and East European studies. His PhD is also from Yale in Russian and Soviet military history. He uh, co-authored a book with his father, a Yale professor, uh, which, dealt, which was entitled While America Sleeps, dealing with uh, self-delusion, military weakness, and the threat seen in the year 2000. Uh, we uh, are absolutely uh, delighted that he's, he's with us. The, uh, he taught at West Point, the United States Military Academy, for a decade, <laughs> teaching courses in military art, grand strategy, perhaps as Mr. Gaddis does at, at Yale, and uh, also uh, diplomatic history and, and uh, uh, the problem of revolutionary struggles. So he brings to us uh, a long concern with these kind of questions of combat and questions of strategy. Uh, he's been with the American Enterprise Institute as a resident scholar for the last two years, and as I say, was a co-author of that very important report. So it's my great pleasure to present to you Dr. Frederick W. Kagan. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's nice uh, to see so many people who want to come and discuss this extremely important issue. Uh, I will try to ensure that you have not wasted your evening. But I make no promises. Um, the one question I will tell you up front that I will not answer is, will the surge work? Um, as a military historian, I will tell you that the one thing you can never do in war is predict the outcome or very rarely, there are occasions. I mean, if the French attack the Swiss, you can be pretty sure that the French are gonna win. <laughs> but, <clears throat> although the track record of the French army sometimes leaves a little bit of room for doubt there. <laughs> Sorry. But in war in general, predicting outcomes is tremendously difficult. You can't look at numbers, you can't look at equipment, you can't look at training. Even if you could measure all sorts of intangibles like morale and determination and so forth, you still couldn't predict the outcome because war is a fundamentally human act undertaking. And human undertakings, in my experience, are not on the whole predictable. And it's very important, in my view, to keep hold of that fact because it's no more right for anyone to tell you that the surge will definitely fail than it would be for me to tell you that it will definitely work. Probabilities remain both ways, and I think that we are at a very critical moment. What I'd like to do is to give you as much as I can uh, an understanding of what is actually going on in Iraq at the moment which has been informed by my continuous uh, study of this and also by two visits that I've made to Iraq um, over the past couple of months, uh, traveling around and talking to a lot of people and trying to get a sense for how things are progressing and trying to grasp this problem and its complexity. The first thing that I want to tell you is that Iraq is very, very different in its reality from what you would get uh, the sense from just by reading the newspapers and especially looking at headlines. <clears throat> that isn't to say that it's better. That isn't to say that there's anything inevitable about success that the media is covering up. It is simply to say that it's different. And it is very complex. And it is the sort of complexity that requires continuous engagement and as much as possible tasting and touching it in order to get a sense of it. 
To talk about where we are, it's helpful to think about how we got here. And no, I'm not going to go back and revisit the question of whether we should have invaded Iraq, whether the Bush administration fought the war well or badly. Uh, I think the <clears throat> answer to one of those questions depends in part on the outcome of the struggle. The answer to the other has already been decided rather clearly. But I do want to point out that America pursued a very consistent strategy in Iraq from the end of 2003 when it first started to become apparent to those who would pay attention that we were facing an insurgency and that things were not simply going to proceed smoothly in the desired direction until January 10th, 2007 when the President announced that he would pursue a new strategy. And that consistent strategy was a strategy of training up an Iraqi force to take responsibility for establishing and maintaining security in Iraq, keeping our numbers in Iraq as low as possible consistent with that mission, handing responsibility for maintaining security over to the Iraqis as quickly as possible and withdrawing as quickly as possible. That was the stated and implemented strategy of American forces in Iraq from the end of 2003 until January 10, 2007. Notably absent in that strategy, for those of you who are familiar with counterinsurgency, was any focus on actually ourselves helping directly to establish and maintain security for the Iraqi people, which was a pretty significant lacuna. Because as you look at successful counterinsurgencies and you talk about the tasks involved in counterinsurgency, one of the things that stands out most clearly is that if you are not providing security for the population, the likelihood of political, economic, social, and so forth development in any sort of positive direction is virtually nil. Furthermore, the difficulties of standing up an army and police force in the context of rampant insurgency and requiring them on their own to tamp it down, there's not a lot of precedent for that. In fact, I can't offhand think of any successful case, although there have been lots of weird cases of counterinsurgencies, and there may be one. But I, I, I'm not pulling it up right now. So this was rather a, an odd strategy to be pursuing. Now, if you like, in questions, I'll be happy to talk to you about why I think it was that General John Abizade and General George Casey, Abizade was the CENTCOM commander from mid-2003. Casey took over as commander of US forces in Iraq in mid-2004. Why they consistently pursued this strategy, it was not an idiotic argument. I understand it perfectly well intellectually. I just happen to think that it was wrong-headed. Be that as it may, on January 10th, the president gave a speech in which he announced a change in strategy to one that focused on providing security for the Iraqi population in the first instance, and only secondarily uh, working on training up the Iraqi army and police and transitioning responsibility to them. He announced that he would dedicate more American forces to the effort in Iraq for the purpose of pursuing this strategy. And he announced that he would um, replace the command team in Iraq. Um, and that's how, in mid-February, General David Petraeus became the commander of multinational forces Iraq, the commander of all US, in fact, all coalition military forces in Iraq. We subsequently had a new ambassador named uh, ambassador Ryan Crocker, who replaced Ambassador Zalmay Khalilzad, who had served with uh, considerable distinction in a very difficult time from, for a number of uh, years. And we've seen changes throughout um, the military hierarchy, and I think we are seeing increasingly changes within, within the civilian hierarchy over there as well. The five additional combat brigades that the President announced he would be sending in January began to arrive at the rate of one a month. Um, and by the end of January, the first was in place. The last one um, is just going in even as we speak. So within a few weeks, the surge that has been become the, the way that this is perceived and described uh, will be complete. But I'm a guy who's all about complexity. And what I want to tell you is the story is more complicated than that. In the first place, the this has been this whole strategy, strategic shift has been reduced to the uh, the term surge, and the focus has been on the assumption that if we simply put five additional brigades in Iraq, that that would turn the tide. That was never the assumption. It was never the assumption that our group, the Iraq Planning Group at AI, operated under, and it was not the assumption that underlay the president's uh, determination to do this either. The focus was always the change in strategy from one that focused on train and transition 
to one that focused on providing security to the Iraqi people. The increase in forces was because it was thought necessary in order to accomplish that mission. It was never thought that the increase in forces by itself would take care of the problem. And I'm, by the way, 100 percent in agreement with that. And if it had simply been a matter of adding five brigades to what we had been doing in the past, I would have opposed it. Um, in addition to that, it's important to think about what these brigades are actually doing. These brigades are going in to neighborhoods, which is also a departure from past practice. There had been in the past a handful of U.S. units that had operated regularly outside of their bases. But for the most part, American combat brigades in Iraq between uh, early 2004 and uh, early 2007 or late 2006 operated from forward operating bases and conducted generally mounted patrols. That is to say, they would drive from their forward operating base through a neighborhood for a while um, and then return to the base uh, where they would sleep. The new strategy focuses on pushing American soldiers off of the FOBs and embedding them within the neighborhoods where they are now living. And they're living in joint security stations and combat outposts, which are significantly more bare bones, significantly less comfortable. I visited a couple of them, and my heart goes out to the soldiers who will be living there in 130 degree heat. Um, and of course, significantly more exposed. The idea behind that is that if you simply drive through a neighborhood, you're, the likelihood that you will actually gain an understanding of the neighborhood and, and gain an understanding of what's going on and gain the trust of the people so that they will actually begin to give you intelligence about what's going on and you can improve your understanding and find out who the bad guys are and what they're trying to do and how you can stop them and work with the local people to stop them is very low. But when American forces move into joint security stations and start conducting dismounted patrols, which is what they do, and mingle with the population so that they become known, and start establishing trust relations with the local people so that they get tips, then you find that the intelligence that they get about the local situation goes up dramatically. And this, in fact, has been what our units have found. And a number of commanders who were there uh, that I spoke with before the surge began um, and have since shifted their approach remarked on how their heads were nearly blown off by how much intelligence they started to receive as they moved into the neighborhood and how much information they started to get from the local people telling them, bad guys are coming into the neighborhood. We don't know who they are. They're holed up in that house. Could you go check it out, please? Information of that variety. Also information of the following variety. I saw a guy with a hood over his head come out at midnight and plant what looked like an IED in a tripwire right over there. I think you might want to take a look at it, but don't step on it. And then our guys will go out and look into it. And this is one of the reasons why we've been discovering a lot more IEDs as a percentage of those that are planted rather than, that is to say, discovering them without setting them off um, because we've been getting more intelligence. Now, of course, on the other hand, as you push out of areas where you had been into areas where you hadn't been, one of the things that happens is that you start to move into areas that the enemy had controlled. Now, let me talk to you for just a minute about how our reporting works. The way that the military understands uh, what's going on with a local unit is significant acts, significant actions are reported up. And a significant action can be anything from an IED strike to a large raid to seizing an enemy combat, uh, combatant or, or doing a lot of other things. But one of the characteristics of significant acts is that where there are no US forces, there are no SIG acts. And so neighborhoods look very peaceful on a map if you simply plot SIG acts when we have no forces in them. And of course, neighborhoods that the enemy controls do tend to be relatively peaceful because the enemy controls them. But that doesn't mean that we're actually moving any forwarder in the direction of accomplishing our overall goal, which is to establish to build a stability in Iraq. Because if Al Qaeda controls a neighborhood, then the sort of peace that's imposed on that neighborhood is not the sort that is actually conducive to having a stable Iraq as a whole. But the first thing that happens when you start to move soldiers off of their bases and out of areas where, he, where we had had relative predominance into areas that the enemy actually has been controlling is that you get a lot more contact reports and a lot more SIG acts, and you start to find that the enemy fights back. And that's one of the things that we've been seeing. The enemy has surged against us to meet our own surge. And Al Qaeda in Iraq is a very formidable enemy in that it understands our media cycle very well. And it is very well aware that any time a suicide truck bomb goes off, it's front page news. 
And that's one of the reasons why you'll see the timing of those truck bombs sometimes coincide pretty tightly with significant political events in the United States that Al-Qaeda wishes to influence. But we can also make a mistake if we imagine that everything that happens in Iraq happens in response to us. And this is a typical American failing. And we do tend to be a fairly narcissistic society. And we do tend to believe that whatever happens in the world, good or bad, is our responsibility. I don't think that's true. And I know that it's not true in Iraq. Because in Iraq, we're talking about multiple enemies. We have, on the one hand, al-Qaeda in Iraq, which has been playing a very negative role, as we all know. We also have Shia militias, principally the, the Jaysh al-Mehdi, uh, which, which is nominally um, under the control of Muqtada al-Sadr, although, in fact, he controls very little of it at this point, I suspect, uh, which has been engaged in death squad activity against uh, Sunni and has also been fighting al-Qaeda. Some of the bombs that you see going off in Baghdad that are planted by al-Qaeda have as their purpose retaliating for Jaysh al-Mehdi attacks. Some of the Jaysh al-Mehdi killings that you see going on in Iraq have as their purpose retaliating for al-Qaeda bombings. So it's a rather complicated situation. I don't think it's beyond anyone's ability to comprehend, but it is beyond anyone's ability to put simply in one sentence. And this is part of the problem that we're having. We must be willing to grapple with this situation in all of its complexity if we're to hope to understand it well enough to make sound decisions about it. All of this is a long way of pointing out that the moment a unit arrives in a new area is not the moment the unit begins to operate effectively in that area. Because the sort of intelligence that I'm talking about takes a while to develop. And in truth, looking back over, we've had many units now rotating through Iraq, and we can tell about how long it takes. It's a period anywhere between 30 and 60 days that a new unit in a new neighborhood requires actually to gain the understanding of the neighborhood to be able to function effectively. And that is also the long way of explaining why now is far too soon to tell whether the surge will work or not, or even to evaluate whether it is working or not. Because we're still very early in the process of getting all of our forces not simply into the country, but able to operate effectively around the country. And that's why General Petraeus and General Odierno have been very clear that they don't think they're going to be able to make a meaningful evaluation of the likelihood of success until September. And it's unlikely that Iraq will be secured, or rather that Baghdad will be secured. And we should remember, this is the Baghdad security plan that we're talking about, not the Iraq security plan. That Baghdad will be secured before the end of this year. And that has always, always been my view as well. And that was what I laid out um, in the American Enterprise Institute report that advocated doing something similar to but not identical with what was actually done. We said yes, we thought it would take through 2007 to get uh, for all of this to work. Now the additional complexity, there's additional complexity that comes into this because the Baghdad security plan doesn't just deal with Baghdad. Because the enemy, both Sunni and Shia, have important bases that are outside of the city. And those bases lie in what General Petraeus has taken to calling the Baghdad belts, which are the villages and towns to the south and north of Baghdad. In general terms, the belt to the south had been dominated pretty thoroughly by al-Qaeda. That's the area in which we recently had soldiers attacked and kidnapped. That had been a very strong al-Qaeda base, which we've taken away from them, and they have been retaliating for that. There is also significant al-Qaeda activity to the north and west in the belt that runs from Abu Ghraib, and I apologize for not bringing a map for you, but uh, runs from Abu Ghraib around to the north to Taji. As you start to move to the east of that, and especially to the southeast, you'll find a significant Shia bases, especially al along the road that leads through Kut down to Basra. It is a line along which significant reinforcements flow from the south into Sadr City and elsewhere. General Petraeus and General Odierno wisely decided that before tackling full bore the problem of securing Baghdad, they would work to interdict the bases that the enemy had established in the immediate environs in ba of Baghdad in these belt areas, which is why a significant proportion of the surge forces have not gone directly into the city of Baghdad, but rather have gone into clearing out these al-Qaeda nests, particularly car bomb factories and so forth, that have been uh, based in the belts around the city. And that's one of the reasons why you've started to see violence increase in those areas. This is described sometimes as squeezing the water balloon, and people are talking about how the violence is squeezing out of Baghdad. 
The truth is that's not primarily what's going on. Primarily what's going on is that we have been moving forces into areas near the capital but outside of it that had been enemy bases and the enemy is fighting us there. The enemy that's fighting us there is not primarily coming from Baghdad. They're primarily, they were there in areas that we had not been contesting. And when we move into an enemy contested area, the violence increases. The exception to this pattern has been in Diyala, which is the province to the northeast of Baghdad, <laughs> whose capital is Bakuba. Diyala had been deteriorating since mid-2006 under the previous strategy uh, for a wide variety of reasons, including it's in many respects one of the most challenging provinces in Iraq. There is a significant Sunni Shia uh, mixed population. Most of the cities in Diyala are mixed. In addition, there's a significant Kurdish presence in the north. It runs to the Iranian border, and the Iranians have been funneling weapons and fighters across the border into Diyala, helping, by the way, both sides in the struggle, both Sunni and Shia. Uh, and generally trying to fuel violence there, and they've been successful. In addition, Bakuba is about 35 miles outside of Baghdad, and so very naturally there is a certain connection between what happens in Bakuba and what happens in Baghdad. General Odierno um, decided that he wanted to reinforce our troops in Diyala to try to keep this under control, and he has done so, but I don't believe that he has enough forces in Diyala actually to pacify the province, and I don't think that that's the strategy. The focus of the current plan is to establish security in Baghdad, and forces operating outside of Baghdad are doing so primarily to support that effort. So I think you're going to continue to see violence in Diyala province for a considerable period of time until we've actually managed to get uh, Baghdad secure enough that we can start to move uh, forces beyond it. Now, just as I say that I don't believe that we're responsible for every good thing that happens in the world, and I don't think that we're to blame for every bad thing that happens in the world, and I don't think that everyone in the world operates simply for or against us, we have seen in Iraq a movement begin to develop that we did not cause, although actions we took facilitated it, which has been tremendously positive. And that movement, of course, is the Anbar Awakening. Anbar province had been very solidly under the control of Sunni Arab insurgents since the fall of the regime. It was the Sunni homeland. It is the Sunni homeland in Iraq. And the tribal leaders um, were marginalized by a group of insurgents who basically took control and continued the fight for the old regime on the one hand or for al-Qaeda on the other. And the situation in Anbar got so bad that by mid-2006, the Marine Intelligence Officer who was responsible for evaluating the province decided that it was hopelessly lost and that we would not be able to do anything to regain it. Shortly thereafter, a movement began. The tribal leaders in Diyala, uh, excuse me, in Anbar, began to reassert themselves and they reasserted themselves by taking stands against al-Qaeda. Why? Well, one of the reasons was because we uh, had a, very, a number of very skillful officers who were working to, to clear and control Ramadi, even though clear and control was not the strategy of the time. Colonel Sean McFarland, the Army colonel out there, uh, with the uh, skillful help of the Marines, started to bring uh, Anbar's capital of Ramadi under control. But more important than that, al-Qaeda overplayed its hand, and al-Qaeda began to conduct a series of atrocious attacks against Sunni tribal leaders and their families in Anbar province, which included, among other things, beheading young school children and leaving their heads in coolers on the, in front of government buildings and killing very prominent tribal sheikhs. Why was al-Qaeda attacking the Sunni in Anbar? Because it turns out that within Iraq, and I suspect within much of the Muslim world, but let me only speak to Iraq, which is what I've been following most closely, there is very little support for the religious, ideological, and political program that al-Qaeda is actually all about. And we've actually seen this repeatedly. One of the first things that al-Qaeda does in Iraq when it has established itself with some degree of control in an area is to start enforcing its code. And that includes Sharia courts, and this is what all Islamist movements everywhere go. The first thing that they do is to establish Sharia courts, and there's a good religious basis for why they do that. And the Sharia courts are, are sometimes resented, not always, it depends. But al-Qaeda has an agenda, especially al-Qaeda in Iraq, has an agenda that goes much further than that. And it's a very, very strict, uh, one might say fundamentalist, except that it's actually very distorting um, of early Muslim tenet but a very, very strict notion of how everyone should behave. And they begin enforcing this on the subjects of the emirates that they periodically create. In Baghdad, we were told the story by a company commander who had seen it. They actually required local stall holders to separate, segregate their vegetables by sex. 
I don't even know how you do that. <laughs> but apparently they had some theory. Iraqis, on the whole, are much more sensible people than that, believe it or not. And that struck the stallholders as absurd. But also when you come to questions about whether, ch whether girls can go to school, you'll find that Iraq is a pretty modern state. And it is not a very fundamentalist Islamist state that believes in that sort of treatment of women. And so the Sunni in Anbar wanted to send their girls to school, and they would do so, and Al-Qaeda would kill them, because that's how Al-Qaeda demonstrates its uh, disregard for certain sorts of actions. After a time, the tribal leaders became very tired of this, and they started to resist, and Al-Qaeda's reaction to resistance is to up the ante in terms of atrocities and violence. And that is how the Anbar awakening got going. And the tribal leaders, by this point, the vast majority of tribal leaders in Anbar have come over to our side, are fighting Al-Qaeda, and the evidence is in mid-2006, through mid-2006, it was actually impossible to recruit virtually any Sunni Arabs in Anbar into the security forces. There are now more than 12,000. The rate of induction actually has much more to do with the number of literate um, Sunni Arabs that can be found and with the ability of the local forces to absorb them. But they're so zealous about this that they've actually set up literacy programs to help prepare illiterate recruits to join the forces uh, properly as well. So there's really been quite a dramatic turnaround in Anbar province. It's not confined to Anbar. Similar awakening movements have developed also in Babil province to the south, in Salahuddin province directly to the north, and even in strife-torn Diyala province, where a couple of tribes have come in and started negotiating ceasefires with us and started working with us against Al-Qaeda. Astonishingly, we have even seen the trend develop of the former allies of Al-Qaeda, the Sunni Ba'athist insurgents, beginning to fight Al-Qaeda as well. In my view, and this is just a sense, I think that in many respects a key turning point or a key inflection point in all of this was when Al-Qaeda declared the Islamic State of Iraq which was an error because as soon as you start focusing on the Islamic State of Iraq, you start focusing on the positive political agenda of a movement that, whose positive political agenda is actually abhorred by most Iraqis. And I think that the movement toward away from we are simply Mujahideen who are fighting with you against the infidel toward actually we have a specific program that we intend to impose on you was a very bad optic within Iraq and has helped to facilitate this. Now, I could offer you a lot of complexity on the subject of what's going on in the Shia community. The good news is that the, sh the main Shia militia that has been responsible for most of the death squad activity, the Jaysh al-Mehdi, has been fragmenting and is now engaged in a significant um, internecine struggle. I do not believe at this point that there is a coherent Jaysh al-Mehdi force that responds to Muqtada al-Sadr in such a fashion that he could call upon them to fight us or anyone and they would all do his bidding. It seems pretty clear that the force is fragmented beyond that point. The bad news is that Sadr's political movement remains the strongest and best organized in Iraq. But it's important to understand that these are two different things. The Jaysh al-Mehdi is an armed force, as I said, now engaged in internecine struggle. The office of the martyr Sadr, which is the um, sort of formal body that oversees the political movement is not fragmenting, and Sada remains very much in control of that. It will be very interesting, to say the least, to see where this trend develops. Um, the most pro-Iranian of the Shia parties hitherto had been Skiri, the Supreme Council for the Islamic Revolution in Iraq, um, run by Abdul Aziz al-Hakim. Hakim has recently been diagnosed with lung cancer. I don't know what his prognosis is. He says he's fine, but you know. But they have felt it necessary to try to tack away from their Iranian roots. Skiri actually was formed by Iran in 1982 during the Iran-Iraq War for the purpose of recruiting Iraqi exiles to fight against Iraq, which has always been one of the biggest problems that party has within the country. They've renamed themselves now that the Supreme Islamic Iraqi Council, which works out to SIC as an acronym as far as I'm concerned, and doesn't, maybe that plays better in Iraqi. I don't know how that, how that sounds in Arabic. Um, I guess we're calling it ISKI because our guys couldn't handle sick, but be that as it may. Um, that, I think, is a force that is generally weakening, although it does have a much smaller but much more disciplined militia, the Badr Corps, which has largely been sitting this one out in the sense that they haven't really been attacking our guys very aggressively and they haven't been very aggressively involved in sectarian cleansing against Sunni. They have been fighting the Jaysh al-Mehdi and different elements of the Jaysh al-Mehdi. 
And there's a smaller Shia party called Fadila, which has prominence primarily in Basra and is fighting the other two for control of the oil wealth that flows through there. Now, very briefly, where are we headed with all of this? The trend lines so far are actually pretty good. At the end of 2006, violence overall was increasing dramatically month to month. And as we had conducted two clearing operations in Baghdad called Operations Together Forward 1 and 2, at the end of each one of those operations, not at the end, actually, within a few weeks of the beginning of each one of those operations, violence overall, including sectarian killing, was much higher than it had been at the beginning of the operation. And overall, by the end of 2006, as I say, violence of all sorts was climbing. Violence is now stable. That is to say, the overall rate of violence, including both Al-Qaeda attacks and Jaysh al-Mekti attacks, has remained pretty stable since this operation began. You know, when you're looking at trend lines in military operations, that's a pretty significant trend line. Obviously, you'd like to have it go down. More significant, in my view, is the fact that sectarian violence, as distinct from al-Qaeda attacks, actually remains down by about 50% since the operation began uh, four months ago. Which, again, when compared to previous operations, is a dramatic departure. 50% is not 100%, and obviously we wanted to get, get it to 100%. There may have been a, a small rise in early May. It was prominently reported by the media over here that there was. The actual statistics are very, actually very questionable. I think there probably was a small rise. We'll see what that trend line bodes. But so far, we have been able to have a significant effect on the security situation in Iraq overall, even more than I would have expected because I didn't factor in the Anbar awakening or any of that, and in fact, Violence in Anbar has dropped astoundingly. At its height in uh, one week in February, there were 108 attacks in Ramadi. In the second week of May, there were seven. And overall, violence in Anbar is down by well over 50% from its highs of last year. So we've actually been making quite a lot of progress in the province that we had thought hitherto was absolutely hopeless. Now, you'll want to ask me, I'm sure, about two questions that people focus on very heavily here and for good reason. One is, what are the Iraqi security forces doing and are they stepping up to the fight? And two is, what are the prospects for political progress in Iraq, which we have defined as the essential um, sine qua non of success? The Iraqi security forces, again, I must retreat into complexity. There are elements of the Iraqi security forces that are performing very well. The Iraqi army on the whole, considering the circumstances in which it was recruited and has been formed, is performing. Um, astonishingly, one of the problems that we had last year, as you may recall from previous efforts to conduct Baghdad security plans, was that the Iraqi army units didn't show up at all, and the ones that did showed up with very few of their fighters. There actually were a number of very specific reasons for that, including things as simple as no one had told them where they were going to live. And so Iraqi commanding officers would come to Baghdad in August or July and say, where am I going to put my soldiers? And our soldiers would point to an empty field. And the Iraqis say, we don't do business that way, and they went home. Well, our soldiers do do business that way. On the other hand, if we're going to wait for the Iraqis to get to the level of performance of our soldiers, we're going to be waiting a very long time. This is something that's fixable, and it has, in fact, been fixed. Another part of the problem that we had last year was the Iraqi soldiers wanted to know, how long am I going to be doing this? And the answer was, forever. And they didn't find that very satisfactory either, so they didn't show up. We fixed these problems now. And we've developed a system whereby we've designated individual Iraqi units. I shouldn't say we. The Iraqis actually designated individual Iraqi units, told them that they would be mobilized for a six-month period, that part of that time included time to move to a training camp at Besmaya, which is on the eastern outskirts of Baghdad. I visited the unit that is at Besmaya, although I didn't visit that training camp. They will be trained right before they move in. They will be deployed in Baghdad for the rest of their six-month tour, and then they will go home. And, of course, we figured out where they were going to stay, and we worked out all, helped them work out all of the logistics and all of those little niggly details. As a result, of the first nine battalions that we were promised from the Iraqi army for the surge, nine showed up. And they all showed up at reasonable levels of fill. There's a lot of complexity about how many soldiers actually show up in an Iraqi unit at, at any given moment for a variety of reasons, which I can talk with you about more. But they all showed up with anywhere from 60 to 75 percent. Some, especially headquarters units, showed up at over 100 percent. Now, one question that we were asking as we were watching this is to say, well, this is all very nice, but they're, then they're got, you know, they've got this six-month rotation and then they leave. Will they be replaced? The answer I'm happy to say is yes. 
every Iraqi unit that was designated to replace the units rotating out of Baghdad have also shown up on time and with even higher levels of fill than the initial units had. In addition to that, it turns out, I believe two, maybe two units that were engaged in the Baghdad security plan have actually requested that they be extended um, in Baghdad and that they continue to operate there because they are finding it uh, more rewarding and fulfilling than they had thought it would be. That's the good news story with the Iraqi army. The Iraqi National Police, obviously, are the less good news story. And there are a lot of issues with the police. And let me just pause for a moment, since this is a council that's concerned with more than Iraq, and make a general point about this. Not just the United States, but NATO as an alliance stinks at training local police. We've tried to do this in Bosnia, Kosovo, Afghanistan, and Iraq, and we've screwed it up every single time. And this is not just an American mess, because in Afghanistan, it was the Germans who were responsible for the police. In Bosnia and Kosovo, various nations were responsible for the police. We've tried repeatedly to draw on the expertise of European countries that, since they have national police forces with some paramilitary capability, you would think that they would be very good at doing this sort of thing, but it turns out that they ain't. This is going to be a problem that we're going to be facing in any sort of peacekeeping, reconstruction, even what, you know, not talking about regime change, but any time we have to go into any sort of failed state, even in an assistance mode, it's going to be a problem that we do not, as an alliance, seem to have a capability to train police. That's one of the reasons why we've had such a big problem in Iraq. Other reasons are political. It remains the case that there are bad sectarian actors within the Iraqi government, primarily Shia. And they have infiltrated the Ministry of the Interior, and they have, which controls the police, and they have infiltrated the police. The result is not a uniform Iraqi national police force that is a Shia death squad. There are mixed, there are mixed, it's a mixed bag. There are some INP brigades that are great. Uh, there are some that absolutely would like to do death squad stuff. One of the things that's happened is that because we are partnering our forces with these INP units and are out there in the neighborhoods, we've been fairly successful at preventing them from doing this stuff at collecting evidence on them when they do try to do this stuff, reporting it up. And believe it or not, when you actually go in with an evidence packet to the Iraqi senior leadership and say these guys were killing innocent civilians, they tend to fire them. And there's a variety of reasons why you might ask, why are these people who are allowing this to happen in the first place then firing people when you show them that it's happening? There, is a, there are a lot of complexities there, and I'll be happy to talk to that. But it is a fact that that's what happens. So the partnership that we have going on with the Iraqi police has actually also been extremely positive in moving them in the right direction, but there's a long way to go, and there's no question about that, and that's going to be one of the hardest things. Now, as for the Iraqi political situation, I could go back and give you the various excuses which are real and easy about how we allowed the Iraqi constitution to be set up in a way as though we wanted to ensure that there would never be political progress in the country. We allowed the elections in Iraq to occur as though we wanted to ensure that only extremists who never wanted to negotiate about anything took power. It was, a, it was a terribly done thing. And by the way, this isn't just the fault of the Bush administration, although of course they tolerated it. Lots of international experts were involved in this and also recommended that we pursue these various paths, although you know, a number of wiser heads recommended against it very strenuously and were overridden. And isn't that the, sto the story of this war? Is there going to be progress? Yes, I think there's going to be some political progress, but I think we need to be very careful what we wish for. I think we probably will see a hydrocarbons law passed sometime this year. I frankly hope that we will not see a debathification law passed. And I hope that we won't see a provincial elections law passed either. And I say that knowing full well how that plays uh, in the larger city to the south of here and how it plays with a lot of the American public. But here's the problem. I'm pretty convinced that if, you, if we push for a debathification law right now, what we'll get is a bad law. And we'll get a bad law that focuses heavily on holding former Baathists to account, which, which is code for extremists within the Shia coalition pushing for further uh, punishment against the Sunni. That is not going to help with reconciliation. So the question is, would you rather have a bad law soon so that you can say that you have the law? Or would you rather say, you know, it's probably more important to, to get the good law passed. I'm in the second camp. The problem with provincial elections is that if you hold provincial elections right now, I'm pretty sure that the Sadrists would sweep the South. That's not in our interest, and it's not in the interest of a stable Iraq either. There's a lot of things you can do about trying to do rolling elections and a variety of other complicated things, but I'm not sure you get away from that basic truth. So 
for that reason, I'm not very excited about trying to push through a provincial elections law, which, by the way, again, if you push it through fast, is probably going to be a bad law even in terms of procedure. So how do you gauge political progress? Well, you've got grassroots political progress going on in Anbar, Babil, Diyala, Salahuddin, and other places, and even apparently to some extent in Baghdad, where recently in a very, very bad neighborhood that Al-Qaeda has controlled for a long time, the locals attacked Al-Qaeda and then called for our support because they were tired of Al-Qaeda not letting their children graduate and, st and stuff. This, these local movements are going to be very important. And what we need to do is to find a way to build on them possibly through municipal elections, possibly simply through helping to create de facto organs of government that function locally and then finding ways of connecting them to the center and so forth. But I think that we need to move away from the notion that there's going to be a Capitol Hill type omnibus reconciliation fix everything that's broken in Iraq bill of 2007. Because I don't think we can get there and I don't think we should and I don't think it would be productive. And I think we need to be, have a broader notion of what political progress in this situation um, is than these benchmarks that we happen to have set for ourselves. And I recognize it was the Bush administration who first set these benchmarks. Any of you who have read any of my writings prior to January 10th will know that I have no hesitation whatever in criticizing this administration. Um, and I had been doing so, in fact, consistently until they uh, adopted something resembling what I think was the right strategy. So will the surge work? I don't know. It's too soon to tell. There are trend lines in both directions. <clears throat> I'm reasonably encouraged by what I see, but it will take time. But I want to leave you with one thought. What I'm convinced of is that we need to do everything in our power to succeed here. As I drove around the streets of Baghdad and walked through a market and saw a lot of Iraqi children running around, I was struck by the fact that the Iraqi children's attitude toward Americans at this point, tends to be pretty friendly, curious, not hostile. And that's even in some neighborhoods that have been controlled by al-Qaeda and terrorized by death squads for a long time. And they are very sweet children, and they're, they're like children anywhere in the world. But one thing became very clear to me. Their entire generation, not just in Iraq, but in the Middle East, is at stake here. Right now, they expect us to keep our word to them, to keep our word to their parents. And our word was to make a go of this. They expect us to fulfill that commitment. They're looking to us to fulfill that commitment. If we fail, if we abandon them and allow them to fall into the chaos and misery that will surely follow, they will raise their children to believe that no one should ever rely on the Americans, that no one should ever trust the United States to keep its bargain, that no one should ever expect us to try to see a difficult task through, that no one should ever be our ally. And we will lose this entire generation. And this will be the story, I fear, of an entire generation or more in the Middle East. I'm very concerned about that. And I think it's something that we have to factor into our equation as we decide what's the best thing to do here. Thank you for your attention. very much for uh, a wonderfully comprehensive statement. Interesting. Floor is open for questions. In the rear. When you reach a, a particular point, September or so, what metrics do you use to uh, be encouraged? The purpose of this military surge and change in strategy was to provide security in Baghdad and its environs. And at the end of the day, security is a fairly measurable thing. And I will absolutely stand here and tell you that if the overall violence levels are not down and trending down, and if the sectarian violence levels are not down and trending down, then I, for one, will be very open to rethinking whether this is succeeding or not and to trying to figure out what's the appropriate thing to do. If your focus is on violence, on reducing violence and establishing security, then those are the metrics that you should look to primarily. And I'd like to distinguish those from, project, from, from metrics along very specific political benchmarks, which the Congress has recently gotten very fascinated with. 
As I've said, I don't think we're going to reach those specific legislative benchmarks. I don't think they're the appropriate benchmarks. And I think that they misunderstand the nature of the problem. Because there's a belief out there that says that it is through political progress alone that security can be established. And I would say, judging by historical example, that's actually not true. Political progress tends to follow bringing the violence down to a certain level. So that's how this plan is going to have to be judged. Now, September, you're still looking at trend lines. Because I've said, we've all said, this is not likely really to have succeeded or failed, but not likely to have succeeded until the end of the year. In September, all we'll be able to do is make a judgment about whether we think it's headed in the right direction. But those are the numbers in the first instance that I would be looking at. Would, would you uh, articulate the way you evaluate cost in American lives against the uh, general objectives which you've spoken to? I'd like to start by saying that, I, that I, uh, I disagree with the premise of your question. I think that the American people are constantly informed of the pain that is inflicted upon these families, that you can hardly pick up a newspaper without having the story of one or more of the killed and wounded told in great detail. And I think that the human toll of this war is very well understood. I understand it, if you please, ma'am, I understand it particularly well because I did spend 10 years at West Point. I taught over 1,000 cadets some of whom I'm very close to, and I served there with a number of officers who have become my best friends, all of whom have been deployed to Iraq at one time or another. One of them was just injured very lightly. I've been very fortunate not to lose any who have been very close to me. But it is not with an objective eye that I scan casualty lists for this war. And I would not be standing here advocating any sort of strategy that was likely to increase the casualties that our soldiers take if I were not persuaded that it was a worthwhile undertaking. And I would not do it either if I didn't know from the people who are my friends who are serving that they felt that it was worthwhile. And what I have heard from them repeatedly is the desire to make sure that the soldiers who have already fallen didn't fall in vain and that something is accomplished for the price that they have already paid. And this is something that is a very significant concern to a lot of people within the military. But to answer your question directly, what are the alternatives? We can withdraw and allow the situation to collapse completely. I'm convinced, not because I would necessarily advocate it or not advocate it or have even thought about what my policy would be, but simply as a matter of historical study, that we would end up intervening again down the road to try to stabilize the effects of the collapse of Iraq on the region. I do not actually believe that the United States can simply wash its hands of the region and the maelstrom that I believe will engulf it if we simply withdraw and allow it to collapse. I'm very concerned about the soldiers that we will end up having to send into harm's way in that environment and the price that they will have to pay on the fields of our defeat to make good that defeat in much worse circumstances. And so I would say that as we evaluate whether or not this is worthwhile, we mustn't imagine that there is something that we could do now that would simply stop the pain. I don't think there is. And I think we need to think about what the future pain is likely to be and weigh that as well. Would you comment on uh, Republicans concerned with being reelected? <laughs> <laughs> No, next question. <laughs> One of the great things about being a military analyst as opposed to a political operative is that I can duck questions when they're put that directly in that fashion. Um, some elements of this are fairly, fairly simple, and I worry about precisely the scenario that you're describing. I think that there will be, I'll be look, if the, plan, if the report comes back in September and Petraeus says this isn't working, then it's over, and I don't think there's any question about that, um, particularly if he says that he thinks it's not going to work. Um, the, the only, what's interesting is, is there likely to be a push for declaring victory in September and withdraw, and beginning to withdraw? I fear that there may be. I think that Republicans would be very well advised to think about what the situation will look like in November of 2008 if they succeed in bludgeoning the president into declaring victory and withdrawing in September 2007. Because I am, one thing I'm sure of is that if we start doing that, this isn't going to work. This is going to take longer than that. 
And if we start trying to hand over in September, then we're going to be back to the same strategy that got us into this mess in the first place, and it will get us back even faster, I think, to the place that we had just gotten ourselves out of. Then Republicans are going to have to run on that. And the thing is, not being a political operative, you can take this for what it's worth. I don't see how the Republicans do well in November 2008 if Iraq is a disaster. I, I simply don't see how they do well. Whatever they voted, however they voted in September 2007, I don't see how they extricate themselves from this. And frankly, I think the Democratic leadership is 100% in agreement with me on this question. They also don't see how the Republicans do well in November 2008 if Iraq is not um, succeeding in some measure. I hope that it will be possible to persuade Republican members of Congress and Republicans in general that there's no life raft here that they can jump onto. It's really very simple. Are we, the American people, going to vote for people who get up and say, we voted for the war, we supported it for four years, then we voted for, def for defeat or surrender, vote for me? That just doesn't sound to me like a very appealing platform. And so I don't really see how that works for them. So I'm hoping that if General Petraeus actually does come back with a reasonably positive report in September, that the Republican leadership will be wiser than this. But I have to say that I'm not without my fears on that. Uh, witnessing a series of, of errors, and you referred to some of those, witnessing all of those, how does one build confidence in what you call a new policy but which the gentleman refers to as more of the old. Would you comment, please? Your dis distaste for my colleagues is noted. <laughs> I do not share on considerably more acquaintance than you your evaluation of their motivations. Um, <clears throat> the basic issue is you either recognize the reality that this current strategy is very different from the one that we've been pursuing prior to January 2007, or you reject that reality. If you reject that reality, then it's really not possible to continue to have a discussion. This is not more of the same. This is a fundamentally different approach. I'm not getting up here and saying anything more than it may succeed, and I think that we should give it a shot, and I can explain, you know, talk to you in detail about why I think it's worth taking the risk. Um, I fully recognize that as in war, all things are uncertain and it may fail. I'm asking you to evaluate the strategy on the merits of the strategy rather than on your own preconceptions of the motivations of some of the people who were involved in it. Two, two questions. Would you comment on the uh, inconveniences which the neighbors around Iraq create? And, and secondly, is it, is it uh, pl plausible to think of UN forces providing a buffer between them and Iraq? Spoken like a true diplomat. The, the inconveniences, as you say, that Iraq's neighbors uh, pose are very significant. And the, the Iraq's neighbors, particularly Syria and Iran, have been playing a very malign uh, role in what's going on. Uh, we know that there are anywhere from 40 to 60 foreign fighters transiting the Syrian border into Iraq every month. And these foreign fighters make up the overwhelming majority of suicide bombers. It, the Iraqis have been saying this for a long time, and I've always been trying to take it with a grain of salt. If you ask Iraqis about the suicide bombers, they say they're not Iraqis, Iraqis wouldn't do that. And for years I listened to that and I said, oh, come on, you know, sure. It turns out to be true, actually. <laughs> Something like 80 to 90 percent of suicide bombers are not Iraqis, and we know that through a variety of means, and a lot of them are coming in over the Syrian border. Um, a lot of them are coming in through Damascus International Airport, in fact, and it's not something, I think, of which the Syrians are unaware. So. You can think about this in a number of ways. I don't have any terrifically bright ideas about how to get the Syrians to stop doing this except to let them know one way or another that we really are serious about wanting them to stop. Um, but we don't have a whole lot to trade with the Syrians because we're certainly not going to trade them control of Lebanon for having them interdict foreign fighters. Um, and there's not a whole lot. And we, we can't turn off the Hariri Tribunal at this point even if we wanted to. Those are the issues they care about most. And this is the basic problem that we have if you want to talk about diplomatic approaches in the region. That's the problem with Syria. The problem with Iran is the Iranians apparently want a nuclear weapon. Certainly they want to have a nuclear, a nuclear, civilian nuclear program that doesn't comply with international inspection requirements. They clearly want to have control of some sort of destabilized Iraq because they're funding everyone in Iraq who tends to destabilize the country. 
they clearly want to have some sort of buffer zone in Afghanistan and are willing to play even with people who are anti-Shia in order to do that. And they clearly want to continue to support Hezbollah. We're not actually prepared to give in on any of those things. I don't think we're prepared to give Iraq to the Iranians. We're not prepared to abandon our insistence that they stop supporting Hezbollah. We're not prepared to stop caring about Afghanistan. And we're not prepared to stop caring about their nuclear program. The problem with diplomacy is if you don't actually have anything to trade, it's very hard to figure out what there is to talk about. Because I don't think that this is a misunderstanding that we have going on here. I think both Iran and Syria are pursuing perfectly coherent, cogent, understandable strategies to bring them to ends that they think are important. What we are going to have to do, which is the only thing you can do in this situation, is to demonstrate to them that one or more of those ends are unattainable. And that's why the, my main recommendations for dealing with Iran and Syria focus on making progress in Iraq as much as possible to demonstrate to them that we are not going to allow them to succeed in this theater that they're attempting, for whatever reason, to destabilize. Um, we can negotiate with them. I'm not saying that we shouldn't talk to them. You can talk to anyone you want to talk to. But I wouldn't hold out a lot of hope that that's going to work. Uh, because that's the, dip my, uh, as a student of diplomatic history, I have to say that when you're not prepared to trade lesser interests for, for greater ones, the prospects of success in diplomacy are low, unless you can introduce some, some other element. Uh, as for UN peacekeepers, the main problem with UN peacekeepers is who would provide them. Or that's one main problem. Um, you can bring them in from Muslim countries, but that's probably not a good idea, I think, if you bring them in from Muslim countries and then increase the likelihood that you have violence from Iraq import, exported directly into whatever countries they come from and whatever other complexities are involved in doing that. If they're not Muslim countries, then who are they? Uh, the French could send a handful of soldiers, but I strongly doubt that they will. The Germans could send a handful of soldiers, except they're kind of forbidden by their constitution to do that, um, unless we do it in very narrowly prescribed ways. The British are overstretched. The Spanish don't have much. There's just not much out there. And so the problem that we face is that as you look outside of the American armed forces for any armed force that could actually do this, you have your choice between armed forces that would introduce significant complexities into the situation, to say the least and armed forces that don't exist. So I think wh whatever the wisdom of that might be, and I don't, you know, I don't know whether it would make sense in theory, I think as a practical matter, it's not feasible. I, I have to apologize to everybody who had a question. Um, we've reached our, our time limit, uh, but I would like to thank Dr. Kagan for an extraordinarily interesting evening. <laughs>